Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ken Rivers. I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar that we're giving on the role of a trustee and the interim candidate committee. Um, Jonathan Seville was due to uh, be here today to co-host this. Um, I think he's having some connectivity issues. So we're kicking off on time, but you'll just have to bear with my monotone voice until Jonathan um, uh, is able to join us. So I'll take us through it. Um, we have quite a clear running schedule, so uh, we won't miss anything uh, in terms of content, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to just apologize that it will be just my voice that you'll be hearing until such time as Jonathan can join us. Um, so my name's Ken Rivers. I'm the 2018 president of ICME, so coming in at the AGM, currently deputy president. Uh, Jonathan Seville um, is former president of ICME, uh, who many of you will know. We're here to help you understand the content of the president, uh, John McGar's recent letter in which um, he called for nominations for the board of trustees of ICME ahead of the elections that are timed to coincide with the AGM, uh, the annual general meeting on the 21st of May. Now, as you know, there are six vacancies, and um, during this webinar, uh, Jonathan and myself will cover quite a bit of ground in the first probably 20 to 30 minutes and we're going to try and leave sufficient time for questions for you. Uh, I'm delighted too that John Pritchard, the Chief Executive of ICME, is there and able to support us. Um, he'll be able to answer more technical questions relating to statutes, governance and also legal responsibilities. Um, this is the, uh, the second of two webinars uh, that we've arranged this week. Um, the first was uh, on Tuesday, um, and we'll also be putting um, uh, one of the webinars, a recording of it, together with all the Q&As, um, actually on the website, so that those who haven't been able to join these two sessions uh, can catch up with everything. Now, uh, the next slide is there are three, uh, three clear parts to today's agenda. The first, we're going to outline some of the formal things that are important that you all as prospective trustees need to appreciate before being uh, before agreeing to be nominated to the role of trustees. This is part, I think, of, a, of the sort of the due diligence process that most folk would do when they were applying for a new job or going on to a board of directors. Um, then to help you appreciate the very fulfilling and exciting contribution that a trustee can make uh, to the institution, we'll offer you our own personal stories and views that may help to finalize your decision. So the first bit will be about your obligations and duties, and the second piece will be about the op opportunities to actually help us uh, move the institution forward. And then third part will be to hand the floor over to you. And we do hope that you'll take this opportunity to ask any questions to us relating to the nomination, election, or voting processes uh, that, that you see as important. So we'll take the can next- Can I just interrupt you here? Uh it's Jonathan Seville speaking. Uh, can I just check you can hear me? Yes, Jonathan, we can hear you and welcome. Uh, so, thank you. I'm sorry, I had a few problems uh, joining in, but uh, let me not interrupt you. Okay, so where, where we're at, Jonathan, is slide three, which I believe is my slide anyway, so I'll continue and give you the opportunity to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to make yourself comfortable. So we thought it might be useful to consider the wider context in which trustees work. And this simple diagram that you see on the slide out, outlines the sort of hierarchy of governance processes and protocols that determine the action and the decision-making process of trustees. So it sort of starts with ICME as an independent charity committed to advancing chemical engineering for the benefit of society. We deliver this mission by becoming the organization of choice uh, for chemical uh, biochemical and process engineers. We're a professional membership organization, as you know, which we are as trustees are rightly proud of. Society benefits from the contribution chemical engineering makes in, in, in a number of ways. Focus of the ICME charter on processes in which chemical and physical changes of material involved underscores the complexity, I think, of the discipline. Society needs leading professionals in the field to unite their efforts to innovate, train, apply these processes and advance standards to ensure that the benefits society gains are delivered in a safe and well-managed way. So these include advising decision makers on how best to regulate the sector. 
Now, the iChemy enables chemical engineers that it trains and accredits to operate to the highest standards for the benefit of society and continues to recognize and reward ongoing pursuit of excellence and development. Um, our strategy for 2022, which is our centenary year, um, gives very clear focus on the goals on what our members and society want us to deliver for them and the means by which the institution will try to achieve this. And this focus is the result of a, a quite an extensive consultation process among members of the institution and the chemical engineering sector um, that took place in 2016. The strategy defines our aims, what we do, and how we do it. It enables our success as a committed and empowered community. It drives our engagement, the value we bring to communities around the world, and the development of authoritative and influential insight. And to support this focus, we firmly commit to digitalization and organizational efficiency. So ICME aspires to a model of transparency and accountability, and as a professional membership body, encourages and promotes excellence in the sector. It sets the example by adhering to the highest standards of governance. So the ICME promotes collaboration amongst its members and in the way it serves society and its members. We are ambitious to improve our learning society programs because diversity of thought will always produce a more robust and a more sustainable commercial outcome and benefit to society. Trustees are vital to our mission, vision and values and our compliance with governance. So moving down a little bit in terms of uh, this hierarchy of requirements and duties, the Charity Commission guidance states that trustees have and must accept ultimate responsibility for directing the affairs of the charity and ensuring that it's solvent, well run and delivering charitable outcomes for the benefit of the public for which it's been set up. So compliance clearly is an important issue. So trustees are obliged and must ensure that the charity complies with charity law and the requirements the charity commission as a regulator puts on us, in particular to ensure that charity prepares reports on what it has achieved and annual returns and accounts as required by law. It requires us to ensure that the charity doesn't breach any of the requirements or rules set out in its governing documents and it remains true to the charitable purpose and objects set out there. Trustees are obliged to comply, make sure the uh, institution complies with the requirements of other legislation and other regulators, if any, which govern the activities of the charity. So you can imagine amongst that will be the financial regulations acts, um, the acts uh, around uh, equality, um, the acts around data protection, etc., uh, etc. Et um, the further duty on us to act with integrity and to avoid any personal conflicts of interest or misuse of charity funds or assets. So that's about the compliance aspect of what a trustee is obliged to do. As trustees, we also have a duty of prudence, and that is to ensure that the charity is and will remain solvent, to use our charitable funds and assets reasonably and only in furtherance of the charity's objects, to avoid any undertaking activities that might place charities' endowment funds, assets, or reputation at undue risk, to take special care when investing the funds of the charity or borrowing funds for the charity's use, to use reasonable care and skill in their work as trustees using their personal skills and expertise as needed to ensure that the charity is well run and efficient. And the last duty of prudence is about getting external professional advice on all matters where there may be a material risk to the charity. So it's considerate getting external professional advice on those matters. Or where the trustees may be in breach of their duties. So this is a duty to actually get external help and advice uh, where we see the need or where there may be a material risk. So I've talked about compliance, I've talked about our duty of prudence. I need just briefly to go on to eligibility. Now, under the, um, under the um, Charity Commission guidance, um, there's an issue of trustee uh, eligibility, which basically says um, it's basically everybody over the age of 18 is eligible, uh, apart from 
anyone described in Section 72.1 of the Charities Act 1993, which of course you're all very familiar with, uh, but let me run through them anyway. Uh, firstly, anyone who has an, an unspent conviction for an offence involving deception or dishonesty, anyone is, who is an undischarged bankrupt, anyone who is removed from trusteeship of charity by court or the commissioners for misconduct or mismanagement, and anyone who is under a disqualification order under the Company Directors Disqualification Act of 1986. So that's the Charity Commission eligible, so anybody over the age of 18 is eligible, excluding um, those exceptions. But we've also got to meet the needs of the Engineering Council, which is the UK regulatory body for the engineering profession itself. So it's, if you like, the regulator for the Institution of Chemical Engineers, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, the Institution of Civil Engineers, etc. And it holds a national register of the 220,000 registered chartered engineers. In addition, the Engineering Council sets out and maintains the internationally recognized standard of professional competence and ethics that governs the award and retention of the chartered titles. This ensures that employers, government, and indeed wider society, both in the UK and overseas, can have confidence in the knowledge, experience, and commitment of professional registered engineers and technicians. Now, Jonathan is much more familiar with regard to the Engineering Council uh, activities. He actually uh, sits on, on, on their main committee there. Um, so, Jonathan, do you want to add anything into that as you uh, continue to take us um, uh, along this storyline? Um, thanks, Ken. So, um, as Ken has said, the Engineering Council uh, it, it regulates the standards of professional competence. And so it's important to understand, I think, for trustees that, um, that there's, there's a whole landscape there, of course, of other professional engineering, engineering institutions all sitting under the Engineering Council as far as these things are concerned. Um, and it's the Engineering Council which of course is responsible for what you might call the levels of registration, Chartered Engineer, uh, Incorporated Engineer, I, I eng, eng Tech, and so on. As it happens, uh, I'm leading some work at the Engineering Council at the moment to look at all of that structure and to ask ourselves whether we have all of the appropriate levels of registration. Many people think we don't. Um, so there's a lot of work going on in that space. But the important point to get over, I suppose, is that ICME um, does not and cannot operate completely in isolation of the things that Engineering Council is doing. That doesn't mean that we get things done to us because we are represented um, as are the other 36 or so professional engineering institutions. We're one of the largest, of course, number four. Um, so what we say carries uh, considerable weight, I would say. And, and, and we do have a say in what happens. We also have a say in what other professional engineering institutions do, because clearly it would not be good for us if uh, another professional engineering institution um, went off uh, on a, a line of its own doing something we thought was not going to be beneficial for our profession or indeed brought in a different level of registration that we didn't think was appropriate. So there's a lot to say there but I mustn't take up too much of the time. To go to this to, to slide five then, um, the the, the way that we are uh, governed is, as you know, through the Charter. Well, there are really three levels here to consider. There's the Charter, there's the bylaws, and the, there's the regulations. The Charter dates back to 1957. It had been amended on only five occasions. Um, and there is quite a complicated process to go through to have it amended because we hold our Charter from the Queen or from the Privy Council, which is much the same thing. Um, uh, and so there's a convoluted process to go to to make changes to the Charter. doesn't mean it can't be done, just means it, it takes a bit of time and other people have to be consulted, particularly a committee of the Engineering Council, which deals with all of this kind of thing. Um, I, I won't go into detail about what's in the Charter, you can read it for yourself, um, but it, 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 it uh, defines the objects of the institution. Um, it emphasizes, of course, the benefits of the institution to the community at large, sets out the powers and the limits on the powers of, of the institution, um, defines the governance, um, so including the role and composition of the council as it stands. Clearly, those are the things that we are uh, changing at the moment and a set of um, 
proposals have gone to the Engineering Council's Privy Council Committee um, uh, explaining those changes that we would wish to make. Defines the levels of membership of the institution, as I said, um, and a number of other things. So that's the, that's the big document at the top. I say big, it's actually not very long. Um, it, because it just says things like there will be uh, a, a council or whatever. The, the more detailed stuff comes later in bylaws and, and in regulations. Um, as far as the bylaws are concerned, it's about 17 pages, I'm told. Uh, membership classes, registers of chartered practitioners, uh, duties of members, qualifications for membership, application fees and subscriptions, uh, defining what we mean by meetings like AGMs and EGMs, um, talking about how we nominate and how we ballot for election and so on. There's clearly much there that um, uh, we need to look at in, and we are looking at, in conjunction with the changes that are currently proposed on which members will vote at the uh, upcoming AGM. Um, uh, and and I, I would say that a healthy institution keeps all of these things under review, but there's a balance here, of course. You don't want to go changing everything every year, um, but I think probably we haven't looked at these areas quite as much as we might have done in the last few years, um, and we're trying to put that right now. Um, I'd also say, of course, that there's a big sharing of good practice element here as far as the relationships with the other professional engineering institutions are concerned. And we do borrow from each other what we think looks good. And, and that's a role that, of course, the Engineering Council has to, to help us to do that. And, and there are regularly um, subgroups of the Engineering Council board, including people from iChemie, who will work on particular areas that are regarded as um, important. For instance, um, they, there's a lot of interest at the moment, of course, in cybersecurity, and there's a group that's looking particularly at what we ought to say about the formation of engineers in conjunction with uh, cybersecurity. Um, what John McGarth sent out with his letter was a set of papers defining the roles and responsibilities of all of the trustees. Um, I think you'll have seen that if you're interested in those roles. Uh, it also includes the, the trustee code of conduct. Um, we, what I should mention here is that um, there, we would all expect the, the um, trustees, of course, to to um, attend the meetings of the uh, trustee board. That goes without saying. Uh, but there are also a whole set of committees um, that ICME has, some more formal than others. So the, there are ones that uh, I would say are part of the governance structure, such as audit and risk. Uh, finance and investment, membership, HR and remuneration. And then there are more operational committees like the medals and prizes, uh, education and accreditation forum, engineering policy, enterprise, external affairs, international research. And then there are ad hoc um, task and finish groups in particular areas. There's one at the moment on what we call bio futures. Um, uh, because we think that uh, we ought to be doing something about the uh, intersection between chemical engineering and biotechnology. Um, and very importantly, um, we're, we're working hard, of course, as are many others, on diversity and inclusion. And it, it, these are all areas where it is really desirable to have a trustee input, uh, either directly as a member of one of those committees or indirectly as a, a sort of corresponding member of the trustee board that can help make the link between these committees uh, and the, the trustee board itself. Uh, so back to you then, Ken. There we go. I'm unmuted now. So. Uh... Jonathan and, and I have run therefore through duties and responsibilities. It sounds pretty onerous. Um, at this stage, what we're trying to do is just give an awareness there are rules and regulations within which we operate. Um, trustees actually go through an induction process um, um, once they have been elected, uh, which we'll go through these in a, in a lot more detail. And uh, it's about a day's course where you will go through it and, and go through it in detail. So at this stage, it's about awareness that there is a set of regulations within which govern uh, what we have to do in our duties. I'd like to now kick off a little bit about <clears throat> the opportunities and, and 
and um, you know the exciting part of, of 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 the contribution that trustees can make to change. Um, and I think 2018 is going to be a really important year for the institution. Um, I think um, we're about to enjoy some very exciting, challenging, and fulfilling times as trustees. Chinese have a curse. May you live in interesting times, and they do see it as a curse. And we are living through some very interesting period in the life of the institution. But I think within that is, I think, a real great opportunity um, to set the institution up for the for the 21st century. So it's our collective ambition, and very much the core of the strategy 2022, which we went through in 2016, that guides our activity, that we would focus our attention on becoming an institution led by members, supporting members, and serving society. And I would say that that's what our focus is being on, and a re reflection and recognition that we aren't there yet, and we need to change. And it's that change that we as trustees uh, will be leading. So what does this mean? The governance reform process that's been underway uh, following on from the strategy review has been going on for two years with, a, with consultation with members to deliver a number of important results this year. So subject to member support at the AGM in May, there will be an important set of changes to the institution's Royal Charter bylaws and regulations. And this will include uh, our ability to set up a smaller board of trustees with new and more representative nomination and election procedures for all roles, including that of president. There will be a new Congress elected by, by members and representing the full breadth of the membership on major ICME business. This will be the voice of members. And other major areas of activity and change will be a strong push on the collaborative efforts that bind us in our learned society um, and our ability to take the knowledge and skills that we understand and apply them to the challenges uh, that society faces. And then also within that is about the development of different structures, including a more efficient hub and spoke model to bring together the geographical diverse parts of our worldwide community. And this is all part of an intent to uh, delegate responsibility to as close to the front line as we can, where members can impact on decisions, where members can steer, steer things within their local communities um, to the benefit of their societies. So together with the further execution of our strategy 2022, this ambitious program will lead us to our goal of being the institution of choice for chemical engineers, which is led by members, supporting members, serving society. Now, Jonathan is going to tell us now about the six roles that are up for election and the process that's involved. Um, so if we can go to that slide, uh, uh, unfortunately phoning in as I am, I can't see which slide we're on, but I think we're on six trustee roles to fill in 2018, yes? Um, so um, all, all of these positions are now open for nomination. You can see the deadline uh, on the screen. Um, we took the decision that council would not be nominating any candidates for these positions. Um, and, and we're very keen, therefore, for the membership to provide the nominations that we need to have. Um, I mean, I should say that the practice of council nominating uh, candidates has b built up in the past, mainly, of course, to ensure that there were candidates. Um, but we're taking a different approach now, as you can see. Um, so the six roles then are the, the, the deputy president who will take over as president at the AGM 2019, um, honorary treasurer, vice president international, and three, as, it, as they are called, ordinary members of council. There's nothing very ordinary about them actually, uh, except that they don't have those kinds of um, uh, job uh, titles um, as to the president and vice president. Uh, detailed role descriptions of those uh, are available and were sent out. Um, the, the office holder roles vary, there are some specific skill requirements um, and those are also set out. I mean, to give one example, um, the, the role of honorary treasurer, I would say, does require some pretty significant expertise and experience in areas such as finance, accounting, audit and pensions. Um, I, 
as a mere academic, I find some of these areas absolutely impenetrable, particularly pensions. Um, so that that person uh, needs to chair the Finance and Investment Committee and the HR and Remuneration Committee and interact with our financial advisors. Um, given the centrality of these issues to the sound management of the institution, we've said that candidates for this role need to have already been a member. That is to say, that is the current rule. Uh, a, a member elected or co-opted of the Board of Trustees uh, or formerly the Council. Um, that doesn't mean somebody who is stepping down right now. It could be somebody who's served on council in the past. We're very happy uh, as council, existing council members, to discuss all of these roles uh, or indeed any of the other roles um, with um, uh, uh, potential um, uh, nominees uh, or nominators come to that. Um, Focusing now on the three other places, the so-called ordinary trustees, um, that they, they also, of course, uh, I think it's probably obvious by now, have a pretty important role to do because they will act as our contact people with the other um, aspects of the operation of the, of the institution, uh, the committees I've mentioned and so on. So we would expect every uh, member of the Board of Trustees to have some specific duties, as it were, um, uh, as we've laid out before. So if I can go to slide eight, um, an exciting opportunity. Um, we, 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 this is an exciting opportunity and believe me, I'm sure Ken will say the same. It, it, it is a lot of fun doing, doing this and um, the, the, uh, it, it introduces you to some really interesting people and some interesting areas of uh, chemical engineering worldwide. Um, but uh, it, it is a substantial um, piece of piece of work, and you do, do need to make a substantial um, commitment to it. Um, we have to ensure that the institution is well run. We have to ensure it meets its charter and its legal obligations. That's sometimes difficult to to to, to work out. Uh, we have to make sure it manages its finances well, uh, and uh, and very importantly that it has a good it has good succession planning. Um, it, it, so we should always be looking for people that can come in behind us into these roles because we, our time, of course, is always limited. Um, we all we all chose to be to do chemical engineering for different reasons, but I I think a lot of people, most people who come into chemical engineering, have a very positive view about the impact that the discipline can make on society and uh, health and safety. Uh, one would always put first and foremost, I think, the environment, energy, water management, nutrition. There's a there's a long list of areas where. Uh, we believe, uh, most of us, I think, would, would say that we believe that the institution and the profession uh, makes a really positive difference for large numbers of people around the globe. And uh, um, in order to keep doing that, we have to attract bright young people into the profession. And ICAMEAT had a good name for this in the past through the Why Not Chemeng campaign, for instance. Uh, I, I think other institutions have looked on us with some envy uh, because of our effectiveness in doing that. Um, we also have an obligation, of course, to be a learned society, to help our members um, share best practice, to uh, give, put our members in an environment where they can talk to other chemical engineers um, about areas of mutual interest. Um, and I would say that we are finding that more difficult and we have to make a new focus on that. And the, one of the reasons we're finding it more difficult, I think, is because it's much more difficult to get people physically into a room to talk about what they're really interested in uh, because of the pressures of the jobs that people have and so on. So the answer to that clearly is um, IT enabled and there's much effort going into what we do there. But there's plenty of space for new trustees, I would say, to come in with new ideas about how we can engage members better in that learned society piece. Um, so we talked up to now, can I, quite a lot about governance. Um, I'm leading this governance change at the moment, so I'm thinking about it all the time. Um, but we have to remind ourselves that governance is not an end in itself. It, it's an enabler for the things that we really want to do 
in the institution. Um, if we move to the next slide, then um, the, as it were, the um, qualifying criteria for um, the, 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 the trustees um, to be in a, mem a member in good standing, paid your dues and all the rest of it. Time commitment. We've, we've debated a bit what we should say here, but the last thing we want to be accused of is um, putting forward a false prospectus, I think it's called. Um, it, it, it is a big commitment. Um, and we would say 10 trustee meetings a year, uh, serving on one of the standing committees, um, doing member engagement and attendance at events. Um, very important, you, you will know very well that how much the members value seeing a member of what is now the council, what will be the trustee board at events. Um, and supporting the institution staff in their particular areas of expertise. Um, so it's, so it's, it's, it's a big job. Um, turning to the next, slide then we have a set of um, expertise um, criteria we we would uh, of course like to see trustees that have ha already had or, or still have uh, a major industrial or academic leadership role um, uh, who understand regulatory affairs uh, people that understand industrial associations and so on uh, and of course it's important to have had a past involvement with ICME so that um, you will know something about the kind of organization it is I think you could sort of sum this up by saying that it would be good to have people who have some expertise and experience in managing complexity important point maybe to make here though is you, you, you are not the staff. You are not running the organization. Uh, you're in a different role here. Um, but I think you have to understand the issues that the staff uh, face every day in their jobs. And that's why we ask for people who have had some experience uh, in these kinds of leadership roles uh, in, in their day job. Um, so going to slide 11. Um, of course, we would also expect that trustees would be good communicators and role models. Um, we've seen uh, some charities uh, recently in big trouble because uh, the people that um, work for them uh, have not been uh, good role models. In some cases, I'm not thinking here of Oxfam, the, the, the trustees themselves have not acquitted themselves uh, very well. So we are obviously looking for people that um, have, have, have a good reputation and are, are going to um, help us to maintain the very good reputation that we have. We, we expect trustees, I think it, it must be obvious by now, to act in the best interests of the institution rather than any particular uh, group. Um, and of course, we expect collective um, cabinet responsibility, as you might say. Um, there are debates, uh, there are differences of opinion. It's good that there are, uh, but when decisions have been made, we expect the trustees to um, align themselves behind the decision uh, and to get it implemented. Uh, so I think that's the point to hand over back to you, Ken. So unmuted again. So just quickly want to run through the nomination process. So um, anyone seeking election should nominate her or himself with the support of two other voting members. Uh, nomination should be based on and tailored to the detailed spec um, for the role in question. I'll take the next slide. Um, this language may appear confu um, um, confusing, but we're moving from a system based on nominations um, to a system based on nominations to one based on elections by the wider membership? The answer is, is clear, yes, that's what we're doing. We've heard the views of members and we want to ensure that leadership is properly representative of their views. Um, at the same time, we've made clear these roles call for a very high level of expertise and experience um, because it's important. these are important roles and they have to be done properly. So yes, we want strong competition for these roles with candidates being chosen through elections, but we need to ensure that the Board of Trustees has a range of competence needed to discharge their duties in a professional and effective manner, hence the process of ensuring that candidates nominated meet these criteria um, that we have set out. 
Now, the slide set out the formal application elements that are needed to support the nomination. Um, you need to provide a short biography and you need to provide a short election statement because these are going to be published um, uh, as part of the election pack that goes out to members. But we also need um, a statement um, uh, of how you meet the criteria because the candidate committee will need something more than those 200 words uh, of each of the biography and election statement to be able to make a reasonable assessment about whether a candidate being put forward meets those those criteria. So if you've got a CV or you want to put uh, together a, a document that, 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 that talks about how you make the uh, requirements for the use of the candidate committee. So for that. Uh, we also need confirmation of the person nominated that they're willing to serve if elected. We don't want to press gang anybody. Uh, and each nomination must be supported by two voting members who may not nominate more than one candidate in a single uh, election. Okay, uh, the next slide is um, um, nomination process is simple. The application needs to be emailed to the CEO at iCME.org before the closing date. This was going to be, uh, I think it was the 1st or 2nd of March, uh, and I've uh, uh, been able to extend that to the 9th of March because I realized this could be uh, quite a process of actually getting your head around whether one you want to apply and then secondly putting whatever information it is together to do that and getting people to support you. So we extended that deadline uh, to the 9th of March. Just want to now turn briefly to the interim candidate uh, committee which is um, uh, the next slide. Um, as it be clear we set out the governance of ICME is in a period of transition towards a model based more strongly on member participation and representation. And as part of this, the old nominations panel has been wound up, and in its place there will be an interim candidate committee, which will have six, six members, three nominated by council or the board of trustees, and three will ultimately nominated by the proposed new congress to meet the full breadth of our membership community. Now clearly we haven't got a congress in place, um, that can make nominations for those three folk uh, going to the interim candidate committee. Um, so what we're seeking is three nominations from the wider uh, membership to fill those um, uh, three places. Um, and if there are more than three that come forward, um, um, we'll draw, draw the names out of the hat. Now, clearly, the people on the nominations committee, uh, sorry, on the interim candidate uh, committee, need to have an understanding of the institution governance and the role of member volunteers, experience of recruitment at a senior level, and previously having assessed candidates against a defined role, a role profile. So if you've been involved in recruitment, and that's been at a relatively senior level, and you know something about the institution, then you are uh, somebody who can put their name forward for the interim candidate committee. And the deadline for applications for that is the 26th of February. Um, if I take the next slide, uh, so as I said, yeah, so uh, unpaid uh, volunteers will be asked to commit time to invest in a desk-based assessment, and as I said, if there are more than three nominations, names will be selected from a hat. The interim candidate committee, as I said, will consist of six people, three nominated uh, by the trustees, three nominated by members. Those six folks will decide on who will chair the meeting. Um, and then they'll make their assessment uh, of the candidates' information as it's presented in front of them. Okay, uh, uh, slide 17. I think it's back to you, Jonathan, isn't it? Um, uh, if that's the slide I'm looking at, it's uh, my happy smiling face wearing the um, uh, chain the, of office. The, the, the chain of office uh, for the, the president, which was subsequently whipped away from me very rapidly and uh, hidden away so that I didn't lose it. Um, so it's available for the next president. So um, we, we were just going to say a few words here about uh, how we got into this ourselves. And, uh, and I'll, I'll be very quick because um, I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions and answers. Um, so uh, uh, like, like a lot of people, I joined iChemie as a student. Um, then uh, went uh, away to work for Courtaults, which was a, a big company in the chemical engineering business at the time, uh, based in Coventry, um, and um, became involved with the Midlands branch, as one does, and um, I met a lot of interesting people there. Then I, then I decided I was going to go back to academia and do a PhD, um, went to the University of Surrey, um, 
and became involved in the Guildford Centre there. And also at about that time, the special interest group um, in particle technology. And, and I went on to become the, the chair of that. Um, and I think as, as a result of that, perhaps I was noticed and asked to serve a term on council. Um, which was then followed by being on the audit and risk, being the chair of the audit and risk committee, which was um, a really interesting uh, position to have. Um, then asked if I would be the ICME's representative on the Engineering Council Board, uh, and and most recently um, invited to become uh, to to put my name forward for um, for the presidential role. Um, so I, I would say that's a typical sort of trajectory and at the beginning of all of this um, you have no knowledge or really interest in the governance of ICME. It's all about the technical piece and we as trustee board members I think have got to keep that in mind that people have very different motivations for being involved and it takes time to get people interested in how the organisation works. To begin with it's just taken for granted I think but gradually I think I've learned a bit more about how it runs and and how it might run better so that's me um so um oh really got my smiling face there now um yeah and i'm not looking as scruffy as i uh, as i look at the moment here um so uh, um i joined icme because i wanted to be a professional engineer and i think that's what motivates us uh, at the beginning of a career um, and I've had over 38 years uh, with Shell in the oil industry um, and kept up my interest in chemical engineering through that. Um, more often than not, not designing um, um, uh, things um, um, in terms of equipment and hardware, but, but basically running them and optimizing them and uh, running them as businesses. Um, and I think one of the things I would say uh, in terms of a personal reflection is at the beginning of my career, I knew nothing about governance. I was more interested in the professional aspects of being a chemical engineer and designing distillation columns and, and stuff like that. But at the end of my career, when I was running Shell's activities in the uh, refining and petrochemical activities in the UK, and later when I was CEO of Refining NZ, I spent most of my time on governance, and that was primarily understanding the process and controls by which an organization can deliver its strategic outcomes. So that's understanding how businesses deliver what they do and making sure those systems and processes are in place so that they can be successful. So as Jonathan says, governance is a speciality almost uh, like uh, process safety or fluid mechanics or thermodynamics. It's, it, it, it is something that, that one has to learn and one has to study hard at, and it's a requirement if you're going to run, be successful in these sorts of volunteered and unpaid uh, jobs. Certainly, my advice to you as, you as you think about it is do your due diligence properly, just like you would for any other job application. Make sure it's something that you want to do, that you understand your responsibilities and duties, and having made that and understood that, grasp the opportunity, because it, as Jonathan says, it can be a lot of fun, and the opportunity to give back and help the institution become what it can be. Um, <clears throat> well, if I could just say a big thank you to everybody for taking time out of their busy agendas to have interest in uh, trustee matters. Um, I, as I said, I would encourage you to do due diligence on the duties and responsibilities that you would have as trustees. As I said, if you actually decide to do it and you become a trustee, you'll go through quite an intensive induction program to actually help you with all of this. So at this stage, this is really probably about awareness. Um, I hope you've heard also that there's tremendous change going on at the moment, and trustees have got an opportunity to help steer that change and make it ensure it's successful uh, together with management. Um, and a tremendous opportunity to, to give back to an institution that supported us through through our professional lives and continues to support the future uh, talent pipeline. So I would encourage everybody to, uh, to have a go and get engaged. Those of you who have some outstanding questions that would like to talk in one-to-ones, um, there was a um, uh, uh, an email address, I think it's ceoicme.org, um, so please, please send a, a request, and if you want to have a one-to-one -one with a trustee and, and have any more detailed questions uh, asked. Um, but thank you for joining us. 
thank you for taking part. Thanks for your interest. And I hope to see your names coming forward. Thank you.